Hello everybody, uh, my name is Louise Cole, um, I write short stories and poetry and I write under the name Louise G. Cole because should you happen to Google uh, Louise Cole you get an underwear model <laughs> who isn't really, so it's Louise G. Cole. And I, um, I write short, short stories and have loved uh, John McGurn's stories for, for a long time but I've actually chosen tonight to read from um, the novel that uh, was shortlisted for a Booker Prize in 1990, which is Amongst Women. Um, I think that uh, th there's, a, there's a bit on, on, the, on the wall there that I, that I took a photograph of because my eyesight's not good enough to read, read it to you from here, but it's, it's, uh, it says a lot about um, what's going on here in the book. Uh, John's father was almost the opposite to his mother. He was emotionally remote, mercurial and menacing. He could be charming and at times good fun, but most of the time he ruled the house through a regime of fear. Much of his last book, Memoir, is given over to McGovern trying to understand and come to terms with his father, but he also seemed to model um, some of his characters on his father, and this one in particular, um, I'd say, um, this is uh, Michael, who, who um, is a retired IRA um, um, whatever <laughs> um, and he rules his, his house uh, with, with kind of menace um, there's a kind of hidden violence there all the time and I love the way that McGurn is very casual in the way that he, he, he writes about this um, it's, it, he, he identifies changing times and the, 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 the passages that I've chosen to read are about his daughters. He, the story is about um, uh, M Michael who um, is widowed with five children, um, four of them still live at home. He remarries and, um, and his children do very well at school but he doesn't allow his one particular, his one daughter who wants to read medicine at, at university, he doesn't allow her to go away uh, to study. And it's, uh, it says a lot about the kind of character this man is. Um, the solid offer of a place in the Department of Lands came for Mona, that's one of the sisters, and a similar job in the Department of Finance for Sheila, that's the, the other sister. The offers came among a number of other lesser positions that the girls had applied for. To those that have shall be given too much. To those that have nothing shall be given a kick in the arse, Moran re responded to the luxury of the choices. He assumed both girls would take the civil service jobs. Then a scholarship to university came in for Sheila. Suddenly, the whole world was wide open to her. I'm saying nothing. I want to stand in nobody's way. She has to make up her own mind. Tonight we'll all have to pray for her guidance, Moran said. She played with the choices during the remaining days allowed her, knowing in her heart that she would be forced to take the safe path to the civil service. She went to the convent for advice. Sister Oliver pressed her to grasp her chance and go to university. Sheila argued the hesitations and objections she already felt surrounded by, which were essentially Moran's lack of support, and the nun pressed her to think about it. I was talking to Sister Oliver. She wants me to forget about the civil service and go to university, she said as soon as she got home. Go to university, Moran repeated. I won the scholarship, she asserted spiritedly. Would the scholarships pay for everything? They pay for most of it. Where would the rest come from? I could work during the holidays. She felt under great pressure. What would you study at university? I'd like to do medicine. How long would that take? Most of seven years. Physician, heal thyself, he muttered in an over, half overheard aside and went out. Sheila could not have desired a worse profession. It was the priest and the doctor and not the guerrilla fighters who had emerged as the bigwigs in the country Moran had fought for. 
for his own daughter to lay claim to such a position was an intolerable affront. At least the priest had to pay for his position with celibacy and prayer. The doctor took the full brunt of her resentment. Sheila withdrew into angry silence. There were moments when she thought of looking for outside help, but there was really no one she could turn to. Maggie had barely enough to live on. She considered writing to Luke in London. She had even taken notepaper out, but realised that it would be directly confronting Moran. She could not bring herself to do it. Throughout, Moran did not attempt to influence Sheila directly, but his withdrawal of support was total. After two days, Sheila announced truculently, I'm not going to the university, I'll take the civil service. I didn't want to stand in your way, that's why I said nothing, but I can't help thinking it's closer to your measure. How? Her anger brought out its, his own aggression. How what? How pig is it? He demanded. demanded. What do you mean, Daddy? I didn't understand what you said, that's all. She was quick to change, but she refused to withdraw. You'd understand quick enough if you wanted to. You know the old saying, there's none more deaf than those who do not want to hear. I'm sorry, I just didn't understand, Daddy. And that's as much as I've got time to read for you. Um, of course, she doesn't go to university. Um, but the, the grip that the father has on these children, they love him, uh, but they're afraid of him and they respect him. Um, it's a really good read, and I can understand why, if you haven't read it already, I'm sure lots of people have, I can well understand why it was... Uh, shortlisted for a Booker Award. It actually brought um, John McCurn to a, a, a wide, wider English-speaking audience than perhaps he, he was before. And that was back in 1990. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 no,